All right. Um, so my name is Mike Silva, as Nancy said, and um, just to give a little bit of my background, um, I, um, I'm a father of four boys, age range from nine to 15. Uh, so we're in the, we're kind of in the thick of it, but having fun with that. Um, I've lived here in the Rochester area for over a decade now and enjoyed it a lot. Um, and I was sharing with Nancy, and I'll share with this group too, my, my, my earliest memory of um, doing family history research um, was actually with my grandparents. My grandparents were avid genealogists, and one day they were making a, a trip um, up to the, the Salt Lake City Family History Library, and they asked if I wanted to go with them. And so I, I was excited to do something with grandma and grandpa, so I, I said yes. And we showed up there and I, I was probably nine at the time. And to, to be perfectly honest, it was the most boring thing for a, for a nine-year-old boy to go into this building where you had to be quiet and there was no one there that was um, under the age of 50. And I, I just struggled to understand what was so fun because my grandmother would sit there for what felt like hours on end, plucking away at, at a keyboard and every once in a while stopping and pointing to the, the computer screen and saying, oh, look, there's your, your great grandmother. And I just remember thinking, yeah, that, that's wonderful. And um, so th that was my, my earliest memory of family history. Um, but then I got um, turned on to it by uh, my wife or the girl that became my wife uh, when we were first uh, getting to know each other, we were just talking about interest. And she mentioned that she enjoyed doing family history research. And, you know, these flashbacks of, of um, being quiet and, and just the, the boredom. Um, I just asked, why on earth would you ever be interested in that? And, and she, she laid out the case and, and was very convincing and helped me along the way. And um, that's, it's now one of my my wonderful uh, pastimes that I enjoy. I was also explaining um, that um, I, I do family history in starts and fits. Um, I, I just recently wrapped up grad school. I really didn't do any family history research for uh, those two years. Um, um, but since the, the pandemic has started, I've been able to dedicate more time to it and I'm, I'm really enjoying it. So that's kind of my background. And so tonight I want to talk a little bit about um, how family history re or how social media can further your family history research. Um, I'm going to just begin by giving kind of a crash course on social media and then talk about uh, some more concrete ways of, of what it can do for you. So, um, so we'll begin um, and I, I feel it's important to begin um, with a little bit of understanding of the, the greater historical context. And, and so we'll begin there. So this is my history of the internet. So the internet, you could say, was roughly born around 1983, somewhere around there. And um, when it was first around, it was in this first uh, incarnation, it was a very one-sided conversation. The people that put up content could put whatever they'd like, and publish it, and and that was wonderful. But you, as a user, you might recall, um, if you were searching the web at that time, you could just look at their information, and maybe the only way you could get in contact with the people were to email. Um, there wasn't really ways of having a, a dialogue. I mean, there were there were early forms of of message boards, stuff like that. But the majority of the internet was one-sided and about around uh the around 1997 um there was kind of a shift in the paradigm which uh the the people call web 2.0 where web 2.0 became this idea that the content consumers the users of the website should also be able to interact with it that their voice could also be heard um which uh, nowadays seems very commonplace, but was actually kind of a radical idea. And so things like blogs took off, um, allowing comments on on uh, on a website, that kind of interaction um, started to, to take off 
in more concrete ways. And around the same time, um, social media started to come up, come about. Uh, and, and there was early platforms, most of them that are, are no longer relevant. Um, but um, that's kind of where we come from. And the, the important thing from this is to understand that there's the shift from um, kind of the one-way uh, communication to more of a two-way or, or more than two-way um, conversation, which is a, a big difference. So with the birth of social media, as you're probably aware, endless supply of, of different social media platforms as they're common, commonly referred to. Um, I'm just listing here four that you've probably heard one of more of the other. Um, they are they are all different. Uh, they ha they share some similarities, um, but the way that you interact with them and, and especially the audiences um, that use the the given platform can can vary different um, substantially. Um, for example, uh, Facebook Facebook's one of the larger actually I would say probably the largest. Um, social media um, platform. Um, most people are aware of it. Majority of, of adult Americans use it regularly. Um, it's, it's just a way of publishing posts and sharing information with um, the people that are in your, your social network. Um, Twitter is, is very similar. Um, it originally began as more like a, a micro blog where it was just text, little short uh, text messages referred to as tweets. Um, they have since expanded and allowed what um, what is permissible in, in a tweet. Um, YouTube's a, a totally different animal as it's it's only um, it's video, um, but they allow comments and interactions that way. Um, and it, I personally enjoy YouTube. They have um, it's a wonderful way of learning something new. Um, as, if you're looking for how to's, it's a great place to go. Uh, learned how to change out my headlights, uh, the, the bulbs of my headlights of my uh, car uh, by watching a YouTube video from a mechanic. And Pinterest is a, a, another one to, that's very popular. The thing that's interesting with Pinterest, um, at least in, in my view, is that um, it, it's, a, it's a majority female user base. And so when you go to Pinterest as a male, um, they give recommendations and I, I chuckle at them and show them to my wife that I'm getting recommended um, women's fashion and, and other things that I'm like, yeah, this, it, it shows um, the, who the typical user is. Um, so the, the, whole, the whole point with talking about these, and, and this is why, as I said up front, this is not an exhaustive list. Um, there's other um, technologies that are, are coming along and other things that could be uh, categorized in social media. There's even older technologies that I would argue are, are still forms of social media um, that are still very prevalent today um, that are on this list. Um, the, the important point is that um, you, when you're trying to use these, um, it's helpful to um, think of these in a similar way that you would think of um, different resources to get access to, to source documents, um, different databases. They can be similar, but there are differences between the two um, that can make all the difference. I, I remember uh, using, um, um, comparing, um, what is it called now? It's, it's a ProQuest version of Ancestry. The, the, their um, index of the census records was different from the index that was on Ancestries. And so I was able to find my family um, by using their tool when I wasn't able to find it using um, Ancestry. So it, it's a similar sort of a thing with these. Um, you, have to, you have to try them out and, and see what you like about them and, and be open to try um, try things in, in many different ways, casting the, the widest net, because you never know where you're going to make that connection. So kind of with that um, quick and dirty crash course, 
I think you're prepared to go ahead and, and talk a bit further about um, how you can actually use these platforms um, for social or for um, family history, because a lot of people, when you talk about social media, they think it they think of the you know, oh that's a place where you share cat videos, or this is a place where people post pictures of what they ate for lunch to people that really don't care. Um, because who would really care about what someone ate for lunch? But um, there, there are some legitimate ways that this can be used for family history research. And one of the easiest ways, I think the lowest bar is, is becoming a social media content consumer. Um, so the way you begin that, first of all, is you have to connect. Um, it, it's, a, it's a networking tool. You have to build out your network. So you need to find um, the, the kind of people that or institutions um, that you need to follow. And there's there's different, you know, terms, friends, um, followers, et cetera, um, that you that the different platforms use. But the, the, the concept's the same. It's it's the people that you want to get their information into your um, social media feed when you first join. So who are the people that you would, would think or want to follow? Um, people or groups like libraries are, are important. Um, if you have um, a famous or a, a favorite researcher, someone that shares things that you find interesting, that, that'd be a good person to follow. The historical societies in, in areas where your family comes from, um, museums, um, et cetera. It, it, you can just um, think through it and, and you can generate quite a large list of, of the type of people you'd wanna follow. Um, so the, the nice thing about this is, um, well, you, you're, someone has done a lot of hard work. Is this Catherine Wilson? Um, this is one of the first handouts that I didn't distribute. Um, but um, if you click on, or if you take a note of this URL and you can download her PDF, it's 426 pages long. And it's a list of all the uh, Facebook groups that relate to family history that she has been able to compile. Um, she, she has maintained this list um, up to uh, the beginning of this year. And since January of 2021, she actually handed over to uh, Cindy of Cindy's list. And so it, it will from now forward be maintained on Cindy's list slash Facebook or cindylist.com slash Facebook. Um, and she's in the process of taking that 426 pages worth of information and organizing it. So that's, that's an ongoing project for her. Um, so there is a good chance that you'll be able to find um, some groups that you can connect to. There, there's ethnic um, organizations, there's geographical organizations to it. Um, you just need to find the people that are closest to um, to where you're researching and get connected to those kinds of people. The other thing that you can do that is um, helpful is when you start following um, these people, one, the, either one, the tool itself, the, the social media platform or app is going to recommend you follow additional people based off of um, similar likes. And, and those can be good recommendations. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can find people that you really like their content and look at who they also follow. And that may be a good source of, of connections for you to explore. So that's kind of how you get started with this whole process. You find those um, meaningful connections and, and connect with those individuals and institutions. So, Assuming you've done that um, and you've to that stage, then the next step in the process, I think, would be to you start uh, crowdsourcing. So one of the things that works well for um, family history researchers, especially, is as, as a group of people, it's my experience, and I think it's well known by people in the, in the community, is that uh, we're very willing to help out each other if we can. Um, uh, there was a story that I heard from someone making a presentation and they were talking about how in social media they were following a conference 
that was occurring. And it was actually over in England and that they're in America. There was no way they were going there with, with COVID, et cetera, but they were able to go online. And she just made a comment about how it must be wonderful to, to be part of that conference. And who knew it? It was, it's just, you know, a few miles away from a church where my family um, had had some events happen. And she mentioned that just by, you know, putting that little um, post uh, that she was, she had people reach out to her saying, oh, is there someone, would you like me to run out to that church and look something up for you? Um, that That's the kind of people that we, we're all, you know, dealing with. And, and that's those kinds of stories happen. So, so once you've made those connections and you have good people, good um, sources, you can reach out to them. So um, the, just a couple of recommendations when you do that. So you, you need to really um, be specific in your ask and also to um, be relevant. Uh, don't, don't send out those, um, those really um, obtuse or or un I don't know really hard questions to to the group. Um, I I I say that because um, I, I'm just thinking of so let me back up. One of the things that I do since I, I do my genealogy and fits and starts, um, I I take my uh, research and I I maintain a blog where I put what I was researching, sources I looked at, things that I found, questions that it raised, um, dead ends that I, I looked at, et cetera. So that when I pick up my research again, and I'm starting to look at a certain family and I start getting into the same thing and I'm like, I, I really don't remember what what I did with this. I can go back and refer to my, my notes, which are online. Um, the challenge with that is then I've, I've been posting that, you know, my family comes from uh, the Madeira Islands um, and I get these, the, these posts from other people saying, yeah, I'm, I'm a, uh, my last name is Silva too and my ancestors come from Madeira and maybe we're related and are you related to and they just, you know, give a name and I, I, I just I, I look at that, that kind of question and I'm like, I have absolutely no idea how to really answer you. I, all I can say is not to my knowledge right now. Um, so when you're reaching out to the people, just, just be specific. And also it's important to just give them an indication of what you, you currently know um, so that they don't waste your time and you don't waste their time getting information that you, you've already um, researched. Um, the, if you, um, want some more recommendations, I would actually recommend, and this is the other document I would love to distribute. If you Google crowdsourcing brick walls, there's a PDF, it's like the third uh, result in the, the search. And it's by um, Drew Smith, the, uh, the host of the Genealogy Guys uh, podcast, among other things. And he gives some really um, great tips on how to uh, properly uh, crowdsource your 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 brick walls to to groups and and get answers and get it around some of these things. Um, another good resource is if you search on uh, making the most of crowdsourcing on Twitter, um, you'll find what was it, Tara Lynn, what was her name Roberts I believe was her surname. Um, she gave some presentations and and gives some very good practical um, recommendations on what you need to do uh, to make make the most of that. So I'm, I'm actually gonna pause right there and, and ask if there's any questions about this before I move on to the other part. Okay, I'll assume that's, then everything is good. I've, I've got a comment. Go right ahead, Jim. Oh, one thing I see on some of the German groups on Facebook is a person posting does not identify the religion. And quite typically, the comeback is, were they Protestant or Catholic? You know, because you're going to be researching or searching in a different 
archive. Mm -hmm. Yes. And Mike, I'm sorry. Um, so Deborah did say she hasn't been able to figure out how to use Twitter. Can you help with that? Sure. Um, sure. Let me let me show you that. I'm. I personally enjoy. Although I'm not very active on Twitter, I, I enjoy the way that it's structured and it makes a lot more sense to me. Um, so let me pull this over. So the way Twitter is organized really is, let me pull this tab. All right, can everyone see my screen? Mm -hmm. Let me increase the font a little bit to make it a little easier to read. Um, okay. So Twitter is organized using hashtags. And so I've, I've searched in advance just here, um, family history as one of the hashtags. Genealogy is another kind of common hashtag. And the, the, the idea being that this is what the, the tweet is about. And these are the kind of the topics that people that would be interested in these tweets would follow. So this Natalie Pithers has this article about the impact of the railroads on, on ancestors' lives and, and is, is explaining that and, and thinks that genealogists and family historians might be interested in, in that kind of a read. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So the, when you use Twitter, it, it's easiest to search um, by topics. And, and you just use the pound sign and then type whatever it is. Hashtags, they don't have spaces. Um, they don't have punctuation. Um, so you'll, you'll often see it and they're not case sensitive also. And um, Twitter now uh, recommends that you use about two hashtags per tweet. You shouldn't string them on and on and on. Um, so, that's one way that um, you can do it. The other thing too that it, you can have with uh, Twitter is you can create um, lists of different um, tweets or um, not tweets, but people that you follow. And so um, that, that's, that's a good way to narrow your, your focus, find those people and, and, and just get uh, kind of a curated list of, of tweets. Um, that you're interested in. So, um, Mike, is there a um, like a listing of hashtags, or do you have to try to guess what might be out there? Um, you you really have to guess. Okay. Um, so that there are, um, and I can I'll I'll share um, a link in in the chat with everyone about um, popular uh, tweet uh, hashtags for Twitter. The other thing that is a little interesting with Twitter is they have this thing called a Twitter party and I admittedly have never attended one, um, but it's where a, a group of people uh, agree to um, meet at a certain time and discuss a certain topic together all at the same time using the same um, hashtag. And so there's a couple of um, Twitter parties that are often um, like um, that that are specific to genealogists, um, uh, and so um, I'm trying to remember. It was the um, one place studies um, was one of them. Um, th th there's where they they pick a certain place and then they kind of dig into it um, over a certain time period. Um, there's Gen Chat. That's another one. Um, so th there's just there's just different ways of connecting with um, along those social media lines uh, with Twitter. Uh, the the challenge is just finding those networks. And you do have to have an account on Twitter to be able to search it. Is that correct? Or um, I don't know. Uh, I I think you. I I don't think you do. I think. Oh okay. I, I think you can search it, um, but I, I can also tell you that it's a lot easier once you um, to have the account because one of the things that 
um, you can do is uh, you can bookmark tweets because the, your feed will constantly uh, get updated. So if I go back and, and if, if I just research family history again, or, okay, we'll do genealogy, that's fine. Um, if I come back and look at family history, I'm gonna get a different set of tweets. Um, so it's constantly updating along the, the stream of the conversation. And so if I find something that I want uh, to come back to, I can come back and um, I can uh, flag it. And also you can, you can, yeah, I can add it to a list or I can follow that individual. Um, so there, there's ways of, of keeping it. And I think it's, it's I'll have to remember, I'll, um, there's a way of saving the, the tweets and so you can come back to it. Um, I'll, I'll find the, the instruction to that. So that's, that's Twitter. And again, if Twitter is not your uh, social media platform of choice, that's perfectly all right. Um, there's often uh, the people that um, use social media, they realize that you have to kind of, especially, how can I say this? The, the bigger institutional um, places like the Aronda Library would be a good example. They, they use multiple channels. Uh, with their social media. They'll, they'll advertise things through Facebook and Twitter and then they have their YouTube channel, et cetera. And so um, you, you'll, you can usually find something um, through your, your, your tool of choice. So even if you prefer Twitter, um, you may be able to start with the Facebook list and find the people that you wanna follow and then find what their Twitter feed is and then follow them that way. So mm -hmm. that'll be, the way that you can get to that content. Those are some great questions. So, um, so that's that's on the the consumer side. Um, the one that I find to be more interesting, though, is on, on what I call a content creator. So, it, by being a content creator, um, this would be a case for the people who um, don't find their community. They, they've looked and it doesn't seem like um, they, they can get connect with the people that they're really interested in. And you can, you can be the person to try to start up that community. Um, and it, it's, it's easy to do. It's, it's surprisingly easy to do um, because once you get, get yourself out there, um, other people with similar interests will start finding you. Um, that's kind of what the social media platforms are all about and, and optimized for. And so, so let's talk a little bit about um, creating it. So a couple ideas of how you could do it. Like I was saying before, just create the groups. Um, I, I um, am part of an ancestor of, you know, fill in the blank. Um, I, I'm one for one of my, uh, my great grandfather and in their Facebook group. And they do, they do little things where they um, talk about different things. They post um, journal entries, um, stuff like that um, to, to the members of the group. So that's kind of a fun thing to do. Um, you, if, you're, if you're interested in a certain geography um, you, and, the, and there isn't a group for that, you could start it up yourself. Um, or if there's a certain family line, and if you're interested in the Ramales of, of Northampton County, Pennsylvania, like my wife is, um, you can start up a group um, that, that's interested in researching that and, and you can get together and, and discuss um, those names, um, especially if it's a, a predominant uh, name. So that that's what you do, you, you can, Pick your, pick your favorite social media platform or multiple and, and just start creating the groups and, and posting content to it and, and starting up the conversation. So, and then I've already kind of hit on this, but um, sharing your research. I'm a, a big fan of this. Um, like I said before, I have my, my blog where I keep my, uh, my family history research efforts. And on it, um, I, uh, 
I get reached out to a lot uh, for it and also get people, um, it's, it's more people trying to connect with me along those lines. And one of the reasons why um, this happens is um, largely due to the way that Google um, works. So uh, one of the things that Google does when uh, Web 2.0 was trying to, to take off, they were very interested in um, content that was relevant, um, that was timely, that was up to date. And they thought content that had comments and people regularly posting comments to indicated that it was up to date and relevant. And so blogs um, ended up being a, a better platform uh, for content in Google rankings than websites. So if you took um, your family history research and you published it um, to, to the web using you know, some HTML export kind of functionality that's built into the programs nowadays, uh, that, that's great. And you might connect to people that way. Um, but if it's, if it's published on a blog, Google will actually like it better and, and get you higher up on the, the search results uh, with the exact same content, no, no difference there. Uh, just by virtue of it being on a blog, you'll get a better um, rating. And I, I, I know that because of, um, I, I wrote, and it was one of those days where um, I, I just needed a break from the things that I was currently researching. I felt like I had reached an end and and was a little, honestly, a little frustrated. Um, so I just decided to take a detour and try something else for a little bit and then come back to that problem. And so I just looked into just the history of, of my surname. I was like, well, where does the Silva surname come from? How far back in history does it go? Where did it originate? And so I started looking into that question for just a little bit. And I wrote like, I don't know, maybe half a page worth of content on that. Um, on my blog, just sharing what I what I discovered, and well, when I did that, the, the that post in particular just blew up. People started um, coming to my blog just for that reason, um, because they came across that at one point. It, not anymore. Um, I, I was third on Google's um, search list when you looked up um, like Silva surname, um, and. And so I, I got lots of traffic and, and it, it reinforced itself because people kept posting things and commenting. And there, there was this uh, discussion that was going on about you know all, all the different um, stories that they heard of where it came from and, and this is not true and this is true. And uh, just really interesting conversation. I, I enjoyed it a lot. And, and so that happened just by virtue of, of putting myself out there. And it was kind of a, a, a little re side research project just to, to deal with some frustration, um, but it, it, it struck a chord with some people. And, and so I just think of all the research that you guys are all in, engaged in, there has to be something similar uh, that you could share with people and, and strike a chord with them and, and, and get some traction and, and get some um, attention. So, so ideas of things that you could share as a content creator, you could share um, source documents. I, I love seeing that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in that kind of stuff. So seeing the original documents, um, sharing the brick walls, um, because sometimes people will comment on it and say, have, have you ever considered looking at and giving you some ideas that could take you to the to something that you have never heard of. Mm -hmm. um, I've also, again, this is an idea taken from the, my my ancestor group. They're often posting like this date in history kind of facts on, on this date in 1823. So and so did this. Um, it's just a really nice way for me to connect with that ancestor and and, and to remember them. I, I think that's that's the a very meaningful thing. And um, so these are all just some ideas to kind of get your, um, give you some ideas of where you can go with sharing content. So that is, that's the crux of, of, of how um, social media helps um, with, with family history research. It's a matter of uh, making those right, those connections, 
and um, both and, and just participating in it, either um, it, enjoying the content that other people are creating and or create your own content and, and join the conversation. And so um, that, that's my presentation. Um, do you have any other questions I'd be happy to take from the audience? I actually do because you had um, Pinterest up on your first slide, I think. So yeah. what do you do you actually use Pinterest? I do, I do. Um, and, and the way that I've seen it used for family history research, what usually ends up happening, people organize boards along, um, at least the ways that I've seen it, they've, they organize it along a surname. Mm. So they'll pick um, Silva and, and they'll create a Silva board. So for, for those that have, don't know what Pinterest is, Pinterest are a bunch of these things referred to as pins. The pins are images really. Um, images or, uh, or video and, and they get pinned onto a board. So think of it like a bulletin board, very similar concept. Um, so you, you have your boards and you have your pins. And so you would take, you create a board that was like your Silva board and then they were posting um, family picture, like historical family pictures, or if they found things that maybe their, their um, ancestor like I'm thinking of my wife's case, um, they worked at, at a quarry. And so they found pictures of the quarry back in the, t the time period by searching out stuff from the local historical society. And so they would pin that into that board. Um, that's how I've seen Pinterest being used for family history research. So if you're in the, proce the process of, of um, writing those family history books and you're looking for, um, content, visual content to, to add to your narrative, Pinterest could be a very great source of, of information. It's, um, yeah, I would not have honestly not, not have really thought of using Pinterest. It seems more it's like for crafts and stuff like that, wouldn't have. It is. Yeah, cool. Crafts, recipes. Yeah. And it's, it's great for that, it really is, but um, it's Mike, very visual. Mike, Mike yes. have you used uh, Instagram at all? I haven't. Um, I, I feel that I'm too old to be on Instagram. <laughs> um, but, but that said, um, that it is, it is something that people use nowadays. Yes. And maybe I should adopt it. But I think, How would you use uh, YouTube? I watch YouTube mainly for the old TV shows and music videos, uh, but I'm wondering how you would use it for uh, family history research. That's a good question. Um, I'm, and I do the same thing. I, I love watching my old music videos and, and getting my kids annoyed by the kind of music I find enjoyable. Um, but. Um, the way I would use, use it for family history research, well, well a couple of ways. Um, again, I think YouTube is fantastic when it comes to those how-to kind of things, how-to questions. So if, if you're getting into a, a, a new line of research and you have absolutely no idea where to start, like how to research Irish ancestors, um, YouTube probably has some great video tutorials uh, along those lines. Um, I would go there for that. Um, I've also seen um, mo more like documentaries is the best way of explaining it. Um, again, one of the things that I love ab about doing family history research is uh, fleshing out the story, um, taking that census record and looking up that, you know, they were, that they had this kind of occupation and then doing the research. Well, what, what did that occupation look like in, in 1850? Um, what, was, what was the average um, household income in the 1850s or, or whatever year you're looking at to try to, to add some context to it? Um, so um, YouTube is a great place for getting the, the broader historical context. Um, 
I, I personally have used YouTube looking up again, um, just the history of Portugal uh, for my family and, and understanding where Portugal came from historically and, and, and those lines so that it helps me as I'm doing my own research um, that I can contextualize, um, contextualize the, the documents. Can I add to the YouTube too? I, I'm sorry, I was typing when you were talking, so you may have addressed this, but um, so for example, like Ancestry, Family Search, and a lot of other places have their own YouTube channel and they have hundreds, if not thousands of videos on every type of uh, ancestry question that you could imagine. And you can subscribe to those channels so that when new videos are posted, you would get notified. Really great resource, really great resource. That's why we kind of got into the habit of posting our little one hour sessions on our YouTube channel, just so um, you people could watch it again, or if they couldn't make the meeting, then they could watch it, you know, at a later date. So um, go YouTube. I, I think it's an awesome resource. Yeah, another another thing that I could think of that would be really good for YouTube would be um, the family history conferences. Um, that is one thing that I often watch for other um, conferences. And, and I, I I confess, I've also watched um, um, Roots Tech speakers. Mm -hmm. I go back and, and watch them um, after the fact. And I, I love that because I may have not even been thinking about how on earth to, to do something when they were presenting it, you know, two years prior. And I'm, I'm finally getting up to speed on it. Um, so that, that's a great thing to have. I should mention that I have some little villages in Germany where some of my people came from. And I have found YouTube videos, both historical and what appears to be a drone over these little places, not Berlin or Frankfurt or any of the large cities, but these little tiny hill towns. And who would have thought? And they're done by the local history people over there. Oh, that'd be really fun. Yeah. I would love that. Very cool. Great way to connect. So look for places as well. Great recommendation. Any other questions or comments, suggestions of what you found on social media that might help us out? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, hi. Hi. Yes, um, I use Facebook for tracking down cousins. It's great for that. I mean, once you have a cousin's name, full name, of course. Otherwise, you you know, if you just have a first name, you'd never be able to find them. But I've connected with people over in the UK. You know, I mean, they're pretty distant cousins by now, but it's been great to connect with people. And it, I, I find that it helps confirm um, people in your family tree if you have a name. And then you can look at if, if they allow you to look at your their friends you can kind of see what other relatives that you think are yes. in your family and then that kind of confirms it. So yeah, Facebook is great too. Yeah, but now I had a question on the Twitter. Um, I've kind of been playing with it on my phone during this webinar, but is it possible to send a private message on Twitter? Um, yes, you do um, at and then whatever their, their Twitter handle is to send a, a private tweet to someone. Uh, and, uh, Twitter could be, I guess, another way, because I just um, searched Twitter for my surname and came up with, I don't know, maybe 10 other plagues. I don't recognize their names, but, you know, I mean, they may be related. So just do the at symbol and then whatever their, their is it called a handle? What is, what is it called? Yeah, I think it's the handle is what okay. they call it. Twitter. Is it? Okay. I know that's left over from the CB days. Yeah. Yes. Was it CBs that the truckers used? Maybe. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Okay. So I right, I'll just, yeah, I'll just oh, jump in that sometimes, um, depending on who it is, they might not have, they call it their DM, their direct messages open. 
sometimes you need to, they have it just open for people that they joint follow. So just in case you don't hear from them, that can be, that can be why if you're trying to direct message them. Um, so if they don't have that open, they wouldn't even know that I was trying to contact them? Uh, it, you can you can tag them, but then it would be like a public tweet where you were saying like, hey, at so-and-so. Um, but if you wanted to sort of share personal information that maybe you didn't want to share on all of Twitter, um, yeah. you would do a direct message. So a lot of people have it open, depending just if people have had a bad experience on Twitter or something, they might not allow uh messages private messages from people they don't already follow so okay does yeah. that work the same way as fake facebook messenger where it just kind of, it pops up on your phone if you've um, downloaded the app on your phone you yeah know? so uh do you mean like will, will you get a mess yeah you'll you'll get a notification that you've got a a, a side yeah. message like a private message Okay. Or a DM, as the kids say. <laughs> DM. <laughs> hey, thank you. Any other questions or comments, suggestions? Larry, you still have your hand up. Did you have another question or? No. Okay. <laughs> the computer's running very slowly. OK. So Eileen is inviting everybody to practice with her if you want to try Twitter. She's at Eileen D. I don't have to sign up for an account to practice with her, correct? I believe so, yes. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. You do. All right. So as I had mentioned, for those of you that um, were not here right at the beginning, I we are recording this and um, I'm hoping the person that uploads them to our YouTube channel is on vacation next week. So I'm hoping that we can get it done before he leaves for vacation. Um, so I would look for it hopefully by the end of this week. Um, and I will also save the chat and uh, send that along with my follow-up email. So I'll let you know when, when it's been uploaded and, um, and include this, the chat too. Um, and I think, uh, Mike, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Uh, it's given me and hopefully everybody else a lot of new ideas. Um, Sometimes you forget, like if you, you get so used to working with certain social media or um, websites and then you kind of forget that other things are out there. So this is a really good way to kind of refresh our memories and uh, try something new too. So Mike, thank you so much. And it's been my pleasure. Yeah, thank if you. you have any other links that you uh, want people to have, you can let me know in an email or put them on the chat here. Otherwise, uh, I think I think we're good to go then if there's no more questions. All right, thank you all for coming and I will send information out about uh, the September meeting um, in a few weeks probably. Just to let you know also, um, you may have the email that you got with the Zoom link may have looked a little different to you. We switched our scheduling software. Um, so it, it didn't come personally from me or from the Rhonda Quite email. It came from someplace different, but it looked like, it looks like it worked because uh, you all were able to join. So that's good. Oh, LibCal, yes, I mean, <laughs> she works at a library too, so she knows. Um, yeah, so going forward, it's, um, it's from a software called LibCal. So that will be in the email address. Uh, okay, well, thank you everybody. Have a great night. Try to stay cool and hopefully we'll see you next month. Thank, thank you. you.